So, uh, because it's history, we are all learning here. And um, uh, today we are going to learn about Arima and friends. So, what? Uh, so, thank you, Conrad, once again. And uh, Conrad is right now recovering, recovering from COVID after talking a lot of a lot about COVID data analysis in the last episode. <laughs> yes. But, yes, I mean, uh, yeah. So thank you so much for uh, thank you today and coming here. So uh, what what kind of friends are we talking about today? Uh, well, Arma is basically the word is linear. The word is not linear, but we like to pretend that it is. Pretty much every field that you look at, you start by doing that something is linear, and then like large parts of physics, we explain the phenomenon. You do a linear. Um, interpolation, and then you throw something extra to compensate for the fact that the word really isn't linear. Uh, I mean, differential equations being fine, a fantastic example of that, and it's no different with time series. Uh, last time, what we we're talking about were uh, things were situ or well, model models approaches. Let's call it uh, where you can just reduce everything to fitting a curve without thinking at all about the underlying probability structure, things like that. Uh, and uh, ARMA is the first approach you can make where, okay, what if we assume that something does actually have probability distribution, and then we start combining it into a time series, and what can we then say about this time series? The simplest thing we can do is we assume there's some linear connection between those things, because that's the, sim well, the simplest combination there is. Uh, and then, uh, well, we can start extending. Okay, we have a bit arma. Well, something has a trend. What can we do to compensate for that? And on and on and on. And this is more or less what I'll be what I'll be talking about today. So, uh, so that I just sorry. want to let the audience know that feel free to ask questions in the YouTube chat, and we will be taking them, like. In the end or anytime? How, how do you want to do it? Ah, both, probably. Okay, you know, occasional stop that I have to pause and answer a question instead of going on autopilot is probably healthy for me and it's also good for the audience. Yeah, otherwise, it's like talking to a wall. Uh, which probably won't be super fascinating to the audience. There's, you know, oversupply of talking heads who are full of themselves. And I don't like the sound of my own voice that much, so. <laughs> sure. Okay, then let's let's go. Looking forward to today. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to episode two of our our series on time series. It it, it just sounds horrible. I wish I can I need to come up with a better name for, for, for this whole thing, but that's what it is. Uh, our episode two will be about, uh, as I as I mentioned a moment before in the introduction, about linear models. Uh, this has a slight change compared to last week because I will not be coding live because I realized it was a bit of a distraction. Occasionally, I was like listen to myself afterwards. I was trying to code and talk at the same time. The result neither came out super efficiently, so I am using a. a Cur uh, notebook that already is already written and it's a refreshed version of something I wrote uh, a while ago. Uh, it will be available, I believe, as a comment under in the comments or pinned underneath this video. Uh, I'm sure I can confirm. Uh, so I'll be just talking along this one. Actually, I'm sure if you could pin this one as, uh, under the video now so people can like walk through themselves while listening, that probably would be uh, a good idea. I'll start. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, if you can send send the link, I will just pin it. Uh, sorry. Um, yes. I sent it in the chat, I think. Yeah, I, I have the link. Yeah. So OK. So in a moment, it's going to be there. Uh, without further ado, uh, 
this is a block that's mostly for your for well for your convenience should you decide to revisit this content it's links to all the individual notebooks that we have to, uh, used in the content so far as well as the video talks after the one today i will add the the link to this talk here uh, first we will talk about what's the what are linear processes and warning a priority this there's gonna be some math so i hope you are not utterly allergic to it then discuss how we can extend this existing framework and then show how we can combine the different bits and pieces to to form to solve a prediction problem beginning from scratch first thing we do apart from the usual imports which will happen in a second is install a fantastic package called pmd arima uh, PMD pretty much PMD Arima came to uh, came into existence because people realized something else observed that one of very very few instances where R still had a lag over Python in terms of quality of the analysis you could conduct or the strength or how expressive it was, however you call it, uh, was in time series, in particular classic time series methods. Uh, well, classic, vintage, whatever you call it, the stuff that we are talking about now. The only thing, the only way this was possible in uh, Python was via stats models, which was how the original version of this notebook was written. And then I discovered PMD Arima, and the first thing I did, I rewrote everything from scratch uh, because it just makes your life so much better, starting with the fact that the syntax doesn't look like a throwback to the era of, you know, well, let's call it politely, the not so cool parts of the 90s. So more like Britpop than grunge. Uh, anyway, install PMD Arima, ta -da -da. then the usual imports, some that are left over. I'll be referring, the relevant bits, we will need auto Arima for import, for fitting models automatically, pipeline for combining the elements, model selection pretty much self-explanatory. Pre-processing, I actually don't think we end up using. Da, 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 da. Uh, this is the setup. Uh, this is gonna this is gonna be a little bit math heavy, but I promise to go over this part quickly. The most general level we can start some we can start a discussion about about linear process. Basically, what's the simplest non-trivial process that we can have? White noise. There's no particular information in it. I mean, no serial dependence, no, no memory in the process. Those are proper random variables. They have uh, the same mean, the same uh, variance, yada, yada. If we have a process like this called epsilon, we can, through the operator, through an operation like this, we can construct a time series. If the series we used as weights is finite sum of squares, then this series is well defined. What does this mean in practice? Because that's like the super general mathematical definition, which if you are not careful and you apply in applications, you end up uh, coming to a conclusion that the optimal strategy for your business is selling negative amount of product at imaginary prices, which is a legit mathematical answer. It just doesn't have to make, it just doesn't make an awful lot of sense in practice. And that's more or less the case here. It's useful to start from a general, but move here, yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt. So uh, I got a comment on LinkedIn for some reason that the font is too small. Okay. So would you mind zooming in a bit more? Not at all. Enough? Yeah, I think that's good enough. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah, like uh, for the record, guys, I I have the uh, uh streamer up on a small monitor and i'm looking at what i'm talking about on a big one so i don't know if the font is too small when you when viewed uh, inside the app I, I do not have the sense please do let us know uh as i mentioned white noise uh, serially uncorrelated sequence ta -da -da, with zero mean and finite variance in practice simplest series of something stochastic where we can talk about the random variable distribution parameters, etc. That's not trivial. Uh, it's a, a we construct a series as a linear combination of those. Again, 
general mathematical version, it can depend on the past and the present, like a filter. A real world is causal, which means we can only depend on the past. Uh, the nice thing about this, with this simple setup, we can handle a lot of cases and describe a lot of types, many types of dynamics. Uh, super quick crash test overview for those interested in the math behind it. Uh, Hilbert projection theorem explains why we can construct for, uh, forecasts for ARMA series the way we do. Spectral theorem, again, the result from functional analysis, you have links underneath, uh, explains when are things stationary. And then the whole thing with being uh, the sum of squared values being finite, etc. Uh, that means there's a certain L2 space spanned by the value of our series. Again, link. Good luck on the journey down the rabbit hole. I personally kind of like functional analysis, but it you know it would deserve uh, probably a full semester lecture in its own right, and which is way more than I can dedicate to it here. The important bit in this context also we care only about being square integrable which means which translates to existence of finite variance which means if we know mean and variance we know all we can play around that means arma models work really really nice with elliptical distributions elliptical distributions a uh, shortcut for remembering everything that can be characterized by the first two moments. Most famous example, Gaussian. Uh, to think of an intuition. If you know mean and, uh, well, if you know mean and variance in Gaussian, you know all there is to know. I promise there will be less math after this point. Uh, okay. What's the simplest non-absurd example of a linear process? Uh, something out of regressive. Meaning, at, at each point in time, an uh, autoregressive process of order p depends on p previous values of itself plus a most recent noise, noise uh, observation. By the way, I apologize for drinking all the time, but uh, as I've as I sure kind of mentioned, uh, COVID follow-up, uh, my, my voice ain't quite yet, to 100% yet. Uh, the relevant bit. It's simple to think of an autoregressive model as a sort of linear regression model. It's just that our covariates are shifted values of the target itself. So we have certain coefficient, co co well, say phi one will be associated with observation shifted by one step, phi two shifted by two steps, etc. Plus epsilon. So lagged values of the target itself are our predictors. Uh, if you go through a little, through a tiny bit of algebra, not that heartbreaking, you can see that uh, single exponential smoothing, which we talked about last week, can be reformulated in exactly the same manner. Uh, advantage being, we get all the simplicity of having exponential smoothing and we get to have we get to say something uh, useful about the actual probability distribution so best of both words the simplicity of the curve aspect and the bonus of being able to have some sort of inference about the probabilistic structure uh, because it's de facto linear regression it's very easy to estimate the parameters and forecast something uh, accelerating a little bit Let's say we have a sim we, we have a single process like this. XT 0 0.9 times the previous value plus epsilon. Uh, you need to pay a little bit of attention to sign changes when you have something that implements AR uh, ARMA processes as a uh, uh, in an automated fashion because sometimes people mess around with the signs. Pro tip. Uh, what how can we simulate to see what it actually looks like? The basic class. This is the part where we still use the classic thing of uh, stats models, is you specify an instance of an ARMA process, so one that has the uh, autoregressive and a moving average part. Uh, you specify the coefficients for each, and then you generate the sample uh, of a given length. This is more or less what it looks like. 
not that there's anything particularly meaningful about it. The useful bit is if you look at this at the autocorrelation function for such a process. Because what you can see is that the auto for this simulated data, autocorrelation sort of slowly decreases. Whereas partial autocorrelation has only something meaningful at log one, which is precisely where we do have dependence, because it only depends on the first observation, sorry, on the one step before, and nothing, nothing beyond that. And that's more or less the intuition behind uh, why, how we can identify based on looking at the data, whether uh, an AR process is a good idea. Moving average is pretty much the same idea, only in the other direction. Namely, our process is smoothed version of noise. We have noise, we have weighted observations of uh, past noise values, plus the most recent ones. We do the same exercise, generate an ARMA process, look at the observations, as you can see, very similar parameters look somewhat different. The important thing about autocorrelation uh, the behavior is slightly different, ACF and PACF. For a moving average process, you're going to have one la one significant observation in autocorrelation, not much beyond, and a slowly decaying one in a sort of periodic manner uh, in the partial autocorrelation. Don't worry, and off, don't worry terribly if you, if you don't, uh, like, to me, this comes automatically because I've been hammered with this all the way starting back to uni. Yeah. And until I discovered PMD Arima, I used to care. Yeah. However, if you are not that concerned about the dynamics itself, you just find that, like, if you are more focused on forecasting than you are upon uh, understanding the dynamics of the process, you don't have to care about this one so much. Arma, we put the two and two together. A process that has both components. It deep. Yeah, a question coming. Do you want to take some questions now? It's me. So, um, the person is asking if in this session you will be discussing how to use forecasting on scale for like forecasting hundreds of cities or thousands of stores. Uh, I will not be discussing multivariate forecasting if that's what you are asking. So the question, so the idea here would be. I would say parallelize it. I mean, no, sorry. Let me rephrase it. There's two possibilities. Is there dependency between observations in those hundred cities or thousands of stores or something or not? If there is dependency between them, then you need to account for this somehow. Use the same explanatory variables or the, to account for the, well, the shared dependence or fit a big ass multivariate model. That's option number two, option number one, sorry. Option number two, if there's no dependence and you can treat them in isolation, but you just need to come up with the forecast for 100 different stores simultaneously or 100 different cities, whatever. Uh, just put a... The nice thing about Arma, it's really fast. It's as in really, really fast in practice. And I forgot how fast it was compared to other things when I started experimenting with some of the auto ts type of solutions which have arm which have arm and the like as um component models and that's fine and then you try combining them with genetic algorithms and good gracious ten thousand observations and like i i killed it after like 15 minutes nothing was happening prophet arma individually everyone was done doing it jointly didn't work so long story short if there's dependence Either use the same covariates or fit a multivariate model. If not, just parallelize ARMA and, and for, forget about it. Forget about the rest. Another question is, how would you do multiple time series forecasting, for example, 5,000 different time series of sensors of the same type? Would uh, a model to each time series separately or use deep I learning? I can get away with that. If I can get away with that in principle, why not? I mean, keep in mind, fitting the model once, that's the expensive part. Inference in Arma is dirt cheap. It's dirt cheap. This is something you can literally do in a SQL query at execution time. Because if you have the values, 
estimated, you can park. I mean, prediction from our map, hashtag spoiler alert. Uh, pa, 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 where did I have it? Somewhere below, I can't find it. Uh, I am an unhappy panda. Okay, I'll just wave my hands. Ah, yes, here it is. Uh, if you have your historical values and you have the coefficients of your model fitted, this is your forecast. A bunch of multiplications, a bunch of sums. So it's really, really cheap in, in, in uh, real time. Like it's, it's, it's cheap in terms of co computational cost of uh, forecasting. So I, wh why not? I mean, why not? If, if it turns out that it works, then yeah, sure. Uh, a joint model is, is even better because if you were to do something like vector autoregression here, then you get those, uh, sorry, the question doesn't show up anymore, but I think it said 5,000 sensors, if I remember correctly. Uh, then sure. Yeah, five. Probably, thank you. 5,000 plus uh, different time series of sensors. Yeah. Then you can do a vector autoregression. So it's, it's something that can be, yeah, just multiplying matrix of matrix of your coefficients times your new input of dimension 5,000. I mean, it's 2022. Your phone can do it probably pretty quickly, let alone serious industrial equipment. So I wouldn't worry about that one. Okay. One more. Um, there, there's a few more questions, but I think we need to cover a little bit more than because okay. it's about a remote. Yeah. Uh, ta -da 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 -da, Arma, combination of the two parts. Uh, if, if a model is stationary, please consult part one of this series for a refresher of what station, what stationarity is. Then we can reformulate it as an infinite time, infinite autoregressive series, which means for the sake of building a forecast, we, we are justified in only looking at past values of the series itself, which kind of makes sense because we don't know what the past values of the noise are. Uh, Stationarity is established by analyzing the characteristic polynomial. Again, just read through for yourself. That's the basic idea behind the, This is the crash course version of an argument of how to analyze the stationary, the, sorry, the characteristic polynomial of a, of a time series, of an ARMA time series, and then infer whether the series itself is stationary. Forecasting with ARMA. What everyone's been waiting for. Excuse me. Uh, we look at a simple series of changes in the level of savings. And that, that, that's a depressing series if you look at level of savings in uh, developed economies. For the record, develop, when I say developed, I don't mean my opinion about someone's development. It's an official term that places like World Bank are using. For the record. Uh, this one specifically is from the United States. So we read the data. You can see, okay, something's going on. Looks like there is some, repeti some repetition in the system. Volatility and then changes in the level of savings from quarter to quarter, especially around the major crisis are, are, are increasing. What can we do about it? Well, revisit first revisit our old friend uh, uh, the composition seasonal decomposition, which I believe we encountered first uh, in the in the previous converse, in the previous meeting. Okay, uh, seasonal decompose. Ta -dam. Well, something's changing. There is a trend. There is a seasonal pattern. Residuals are not very are not very uniformly behaved over time. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not that horrible. So can we, let's check, is it stationary? Funny thing is it does seem to be, or at least Dicky Fuller does not reject the hype, the, the, the null of, of stationary. Okay. Uh, what can we say about autocorrelation? Nah. One stick out at lag one, nothing special. 
partial autocorrelation the same. Okay. Uh, just so we can hazard a guess, uh, that looks like, well, dependence on log one. So one, one, only the previous observation is important for formulating the, uh, the dynamics of the model. So let's, let's put the theory to the test. Uh, and this is where we start using the PMD ARIMA package because we could do the same thing in pure bare bones stats models, but trust me, you wouldn't like the code. You wouldn't like to read the code like I wrote the previous version of this code purely in stats models and I didn't like it. Uh, where is uh, PMD ARIMA? There's a bunch of nice things. We can work with pipelines, which is always good. Uh, we have cross validation and we can figure out the right order for an ARIMA model. So, as usual, uh, we have a very convenient... I, I forgot to mention, this is quarterly data. So, da, 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 where, where was I? Here. Uh, first thing we do, we split into training and validation. We have it built in ARIMA. We don't have to worry about do it from this point, do it from this point. No, just give me the last three years, so 12 quarters. It's the little things, but they accumulate and they make your life a little more pleasant, or at least a little less miserable. Uh, Sideline thingy, we are we have not touched the, on the topic of uh, using seasonality. This will come in a moment, but we can already have a sort of crude proxy for seasonality, namely de facto dummies, or well, slightly smarter version of dummies, based on Fourier decomposition. Fourier decomposition, for those uh, unfamiliar with the topic, Fourier, uh, I think I mentioned it in the profit one, but if I didn't, I think I did, but just in case. Uh, Fourier analysis pretty much says that any, con any smooth function can be decomposed into a combination of sine and cosine functions with changing periods and amplitudes. And that means we can keep or filter periodicities of different in, uh, frequency in a series, depending on how we conducted the composition. This is the logic that's behind the Fourier featureizer here. Uh, we build a pipeline, build the usual way, pipeline.pipeline. .pipeline. What's the featureizer that we use? We have quarterly data, so not an awful lot of featureization to happen, but it can still help. And then we have my personal favorite of, uh, in the PMD ARIMA package, namely Auto ARIMA. Auto ARIMA, what it does, uh, after specifying, do it in a, uh, it finds the optimal order for the uh, time series, for the ARIMA or later ARIMA time series. Uh, by comparing the information criteria that we also discussed here earlier. Uh, as you can see, this is what it looks like in practice. Checks different possible combinations for uh, the autoregressive and the moving average part. This is how the Akaiki information criterion changes. Okay, hooray, we found the best model 100, which is, by the way, accidentally the same that seemed to be the best idea based uh, on looking at the autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation in the beginning. Okay, we can summarize uh, the results of fitting our pipeline to the data. Uh, the important bits here, well, the, this is pretty much bookkeeping. Uh, when was it run? What time? I always thought this was a bit of an overkill. But okay, uh, we have the different values of the information criteria, how many observations we actually used, pretty much self-explanatory stuff. Excuse me, this is the useful bit. You, we look at the coefficients. We have the coefficient itself. We have, we have its associated, associated standard error. We have the Z statistic, which is normalized version of mean divided by standard deviation. As in, if something is uh, less than three standard deviations away from zero, uh, it's probably st statistically statistically insignificant. So you can look look at the value of the Z statistic. Things that are smaller in absolute value than three won't be relevant, 
or you can use it the probability that this is actually sticking out. Small here or big here is what you want. And for convenience, we also get a confidence interval. Uh, I remember last week there was a question about how are confidence intervals constructed when I briefly touched on Narima. Basic idea is like this. You have, you know, or you make an assumption that your noise is Gaussian. The epsilon in the, 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 here. You assume that, that this is Gaussian. If this is Gaussian and you know the coefficients theta and phi, then this whole thing will be Gaussian as well, because theta times something, a, a constant times something Gaussian is still Gaussian. Same here. And a sum of different Gaussian components is also Gaussian. So the whole thing, this one, is, is a Gaussian distribution. We can, if we know it's a Gaussian distribution, we have pretty easy ways of describing what's the conditional distribution of our prediction. So, Conditional distribution, for instance, well, of the coefficient given the values. Because jointly things are Gaussian, hence conditionally as well. We essentially, probability probability semester one, continuous probability semester one, uh, how do you flip from joint to conditional density? That's how you can, and you know, we know the parametric form that this one is Gaussian. So that's how we can come up with the confidence intervals here. Finally, we get the uh, different diagnostic tests. Yes. There were a couple of questions about uh, the quarterly data that you were showing previously. So how do you feel about throwing data away to obtain a lower frequency, for example, going from daily values to weekly? This way you reduce the autocorrelation, but throw away information about your system. Uh, that's actually not, not necessarily true. I mean, partly, true. this is, uh, oh my God, I sound like a Facebook fact checker, partly true. Uh, it's true that it you throw away information about your system, you do not necessarily always reduce autocorrelation. Frequently you do, frequently you do because, you, or at least you smooth things out a little bit. But uh, what hap it's not so much that you, what, what you almost always do when you aggregate things to lower frequency, uh, is you reduce the variance. Things are less volatile. Uh, okay, depending on how you get rid, because you can move to weekly observations by saying, I take an average within each week, and this represents this week. Or I can say, I subsample, I take every seventh observation, uh, be it, well, a fixed day of the week. Uh, and that's also weekly because you have week, uh, week apart. But this, but in the former case, if you just average within a week and take this as your representation, yes, this is going to be smoother and the relationship uh, among successive points will probably be weaker, almost surely. Uh, if you just subsample, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So in general, I mostly throw away data. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a hoarder. I throw away data if I have a good reason to. Like, for instance, uh, I look at, I don't know, I look at data and I see that something was very, very qualitatively different. Like, there's a competition currently going on, the, um, what's it called, H&M recommendation on Kaggle. And you can see that people were wondering, okay, why is it that the data gets so much better on people's purchasing patterns if you throw away things before March 2020, well, what happened in March 2020? By and large, most of the world was in lockdown, which means people were sitting at home. They couldn't go home and shop. They had to order everything online. And judging from my own experience, purchasing stuff from behind a computer as opposed to wandering through the store changes my buying pattern a little bit. So there was a qualitative change. Hence, you look at a problem like this in, in practice, in this competition, makes sense to throw away the data. Mm, yeah, why not? Why, why wouldn't I be? If you have a metric, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm sure it's a stupid question. Uh, can the viewer see the question at the bottom of the screen while I'm answering? 
yeah yeah they they can actually i was on mute <laughs> i was reading the question um so yeah anyways uh, now you know the question uh, yeah and the viewers can see ah, okay yeah because i was like maybe it will be polite for me to read it uh, <laughs> uh you also, uh, would you what would you have me say data uh, yeah same logic so, same logic i would have to specify the features uh, differently I would maybe have to incorporate uh, more lags. Like right now, I have a single lag that's covering dependence on the previous quarter. If I had monthly, maybe I would need to say I have uh, a seasonal component, which we'll get to in a moment, or I would have to specify more things in the um, free featureizer, or uh, or just say auto regression of order three. So there's an there would have been an explicit uh, explicit dependence on the, the previous month, two months before, and three months before. But in principle, there's no reason why I couldn't. Okay, um, there were some questions from before. Do you want to take a couple of them? Let's let's have one more and and then say yes. Okay, or it's quick. So the question is, does time series methods make sense for data collected on machine which can have manual changes? As long as you know where the when the manual changes happen, by all means. By all means, we'll actually be, count, we'll actually be covering this very uh, type of problem. But uh, automated, uh, I think three, three, three episodes from now. Uh, where we will be talking about anomaly detection and um, changes in the process itself. So change point, uh, changes as change points. Sorry, English language, hard language. Uh, situations like there's a qualitative change in the in the nature of the process itself. Not just your garden variety trend accelerating, but all of a sudden trend goes from increasing to decreasing, uh, or it used to be. It used to be, I don't know, had a slope of 15 degrees. Now it's 90 degrees or 90. Okay, 90 is idiotic. 80. Uh, those kinds of things. So yes, long story short, yes. Yes, it does make sense. But you have to think a little bit more. Uh, how do you analyze it? Uh, how do you analyze it? Because ARMA itself and to a degree ARIMA assumes that things are stationary. Okay, let's roll. Uh, diagnostic tests, which I mentioned uh, before, you you have the descriptions here. Since, uh, briefly, Jarquet Berra are the, the residuals Gaussian. They kind of seem to be, or at least reducing rejecting Gaussianity. Lung box, if, if, are they serially independent? Uh, yeah, and in terms of and heteroscedasticity is the variance constant over time or not? Uh, how do we compute predictions from our pipeline object? The usual way. We have we want predictions. We want confidence intervals around them. Predict number of periods ahead. And we, we, yes, we do want confidence intervals. Boom, here it is. And confidence intervals. Uh, crash course explanation of uh, why of how the of the argument i made of the argument i made before about how the confidence intervals are constructed noise is gaussian hence our linear time series is gaussian because of hilbert projection theorem conditional expectation is our best forecast in terms of mean squared error keep in mind not necessarily the case if you have other metrics if you want to evaluate under mean absolute error or things like this not necessarily expected expectation uh, conditional expectation doesn't have to be the best anymore but with respect to mean squared error it is uh, confidence interval where the classic result mean plus minus uh, standard deviation times the corresponding quantile of the normal distribution. And this is fancy way of saying conditional distribution of my observation, sigma of xt, uh, 
again in purely in mathematical terms this you that's that that would be the borel sigma field for your time series which is a fancy way of saying everything you know up to this point everything you know and everything you can infer based on observations up to this point a mathematical shortcut for compressing this mouthful is sigma xt the, the, the borel sigma field of observable events this is our validation time series and this is what our forecast looks against real data looks like against real data Ma. it's okay it's kind of non-horrible directionally but i've seen better uh moving on beyond arma It only works if our series is really stationary. Unless you're lucky, your series will not be stationary. So, ma, we need something better. Arma itself does not allow for trend because stationarity does not allow for seasonality. Well, you can kind of have a wooden leg by using the uh, Fourier featureizer or something to that effect. But let's be honest, this is not the most elegant solution ever. So people inevitably started asking, can we, instead of, I don't know if you remember my high quality joke about hammering the nail uh, all the way into the piece of wood. Uh, that's more or less what people used to do. Can we model it jointly instead? And the question, the answer is yes, yes we can. We can explicitly model the, the trend part. And hence, that that's why the ARIMA process came along. Essentially ARIMA, you have one more parameter. This is P and Q are still your outer aggressive and moving average part. D is the order of differentiation. Differentiation, best way to think, sorry, order of differencing. I'm so sorry. I ruined my own setup. Differencing is a discrete version of differentiation. So like you have a linear function, you take the first derivative, you get a flat line. You have a quadratic function, you take a first derivative, you get a line, you get a second derivative, you're flat. Uh, that's how differencing works as well. If you have a if you have a linear trend, you take first differences in a series, you get rid of a trend. You get you you have a, there's a chance you get something that's stationary. If something was moving around the well, quadratic trend or something that plausibly can be described with a quadratic polynomial, uh, and you take sec <coughs> and you take differences twice, uh, then you have. Uh, you have applied uh, second differences, and th that means you have an arima of order two. Uh, how does it work in practice? Uh, let's look at the daily prices of Tesla to demonstrate uh, our our point around this one. Uh, this is a price of Tesla, mm, but rather interesting over time, or, or rather, rather boring after, until something like 2020, and then picking, and then, I don't know, I'm guessing probably somewhere around the time is when I almost got Twitter. Uh, we can uh, use Dicky Fuller, which is which imperfect as it is, is a is a nice tool uh, we keep using for uh, checking for stationarity. Yep, most certainly non-stationary if the p-value we get is 0.93. Uh, okay, what if we take a difference first first difference of the series? Okay, a bit more stable, at least or at least insanely unstable, but around zero, which means we got we got rid of at least some of the trend. And Dickie Fuller doesn't generate a, a protest anymore. Sometimes I hate the super useful, fancy, fun helpful functionality in Kaggle. Uh, so we, that we did remove a linear trend and at the risk of introducing a bit more volatility in the second part, what can we do further? Let's see 
if we can get away with modeling our price of Tesla as a stationary series with a linear trend and model it jointly. Uh, on a sideline note, feel free to examine it later if you have a moment. Uh, the nice thing about Arima, a bunch of a bunch of other things pop up as special cases. Which, by the way, the phrase you guys will hear me using a lot because I'm a big I'm a big fan of of kind of building building up how things belong together. So with something relatively simple, it's just exponential smoothing. Exponential smoothing actually does pop up as special cases from Arima, which we are discussing today. Arima. On the other hand, when we get to state space models, comes out a special case out of that one. I think it's kind of useful to see how those how those bits belong together. Uh, next step, uh, I in Arima corresponds to the integrated component, so the uh, trend. Seasonality, can we do something about seasonality as well at this point? Uh, namely, model also the model also the seasonal component directly. Uh, and the answer is yes. Namely, we can we can set up a similar structure for for uh, seasonality as we did for the process itself. We still we can decide what's the number of periods so. 12, if, uh, 12 months in a year, if we are talking about annual, uh, four uh, quarters in a year, if we are talking about uh, quarters, etc. And then describe uh, the autoregressive differential and moving average part for the seasonal component only. Essentially, we have one, we have the Arim, Arima part on the process itself. And then sort of second arima on the seasonal component only. And then between combining those two together, that's what gives us arima. Uh, brief intuition behind this. How do you establish what are the values of the autoregressive part, uh, the moving average part, and the differencing part for the seasonal component? Uh, I will just read it out loud. You can actually have a look at it, and I'll be back in literally 30 seconds. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the YouTube chat. And you can also join uh, ML Space Discord, where Conrad is helping people a lot. So you can also ask there if you want to. Do you want to take some questions? Yes, sounds excellent. OK. Excellent. So one question is about uh, data augmentation techniques and time series. Can you talk about data augmentation techniques, generally time series? Time features and log features are created. Are there any more advanced techniques? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, in terms of feature generation, uh, there's a short answer and a long answer. Long answer is, well, you can create all the features that you possibly want that incorporate something about the series that can help you, that the linear structure won't capture. Uh, well, simplest example being squared, uh, not just lagged values, but lagged squared values, which is something that, for instance, well, your basic karma won't capture. And if we were to create it, it might help us with this one, because this thing clearly looks like a, a case of volatility clustering. So uh, volatility clustering, sorry, jargon for variance, variance not being constant over time. Uh, more advanced techniques. Uh, the short, uh, short and easy cop-out answer is a package called TS Fresh. Uh, if you just go to Google and type something like TS Fresh Extract Features, that's that's a, it's the first link that pops up, uh, and then you'll have more feature, more automatically. Uh, sorry, 
the functionality allows you to automatically extract more features than you probably know what to do with. Like I've been working with time series for quite a while. Uh, I started reading through the list of features that are created in TS Fresh. I seriously don't understand. I didn't understand what some of them were. I, I had to look at the definitions. So yeah, uh, they, in terms of data augmentation, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one in terms of uh, generating more data for time series because, uh, well, if you take an image, you flip an image horizontally, like, I don't know, a cat flipped horizontally, is still a cat. Zoomed in, it's still a cat. Zoomed out, it's still a cat. Uh, well, probably rotated all sorts of ways, it remains a cat, given the manners in which cats are, cats are capable of sleeping. Uh, if you subsample or aggregate a series, how do you decide if this is still representative for your data or not? So that's 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 a tricky one. That's that's a tricky one. Uh, I've actually been been looking a little into this one. Uh, it's 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 an ongoing problem, and in a lot of and I haven't seen anything close to the kind of solutions you have, for instance, for image recognition. Or in, sorry, computer vision problems. Uh, another question from the same person is: If I have weather measurements, is it good for me to collect the measurements of different places on same days? Depending on what you want to predict. Yeah, like kind. Uh, I mean, I think it's missing some more context. Here, I'm, right? I'm, afraid, I'm afraid so. At this level of generality, I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer much more than that. Let's move to the next one. And if you have more context, please uh, elaborate and uh, ask again. If I have time series data with spatial information which are nearby, what should I consider? Uh, what what should I do? Consider a multivariate analysis, or how do how do I account for similarity in the data collected close to each other? Well, multivariate multivariate model is definitely a good first step, and incorporating something along the way that. Uh, uh, that captures the fact that this is geographically close. Uh, things like, I don't know, uh, longitude and latitude per series, and then treat it, uh, you know, lump them, lump them together jointly. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea for sure. Uh, there is uh, There are the spatial statistics models, which are specifically built for that. But to be perfectly honest, that's that's a bit outside my area. Of, of expertise. Like I, I have doubled in it, but I was like 10 years ago and I barely remember anything. I, I guess this, this question was answered in the previous session, but do you want to like uh, mm -hmm. take a quick look or shall we move to the next one? What to do if ACF and uh, PACF plot shows no significant correlation? Plots ACF and PACF for squared values. If you suspect there is some memory in the process, and PA, neither ACF nor PACF show anything, then the only thing this really tells you is there's no linear dependency between the values of the process itself. Okay. As I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, it's useful to try to extract as much in terms of linear dynamics as we can out of the universe, but it, it's not all there is. There are things we can't capture that manner in that manner, uh, so yeah, plot squares, plot squares, plot something like this. If that, if, I mean, I'm assuming you're drilling into it because you suspect there is some sort of memory in the process. If uh, autocorrelation doesn't capture anything, start for, try building a simple model, nonlinear model, like, I don't know, throw it into an LGBM for all I care. Uh, something that can capture quickly out of the box it model doesn't have to be good it's just that to something that will capture a non-linear dependence between the process and its own locked values uh and then see what happens priced if there's nothing in acf pcf in the model values themselves in squares and yet there is some sort of memory that totally doesn't manifest in the first two moments. I mean, theoretically possible, 
theoretically possible, but I don't find it very likely. Sure, there are many more questions, but I think uh, we have only five minutes let's, left. Let's so, swim a bit more as usual. Yeah. We're gonna be a bit over time, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, special cases, Sarima. Let's quickly demonstrate what can Sarima do. We proceed the same manner as before. We look at the seasonal decomposition. We get the autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation. Finally, Sarimax, uh, Arima, we have Arma, Arima, if we allow for trend, Sarima, if we allow for seasonal component, Sarimax, if we allow for exogenous variables on top of it. Sarimax is probably as general as you can get uh, while being able to pronounce the resulting abbreviation. What happens when we combine all those building blocks together? Uh, we're going to be, by the way, using data from this competition. Uh, training test, ta-da. This was about predicting sales of items in stores. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, we restrict, one, uh, we restrict, excuse me, to one item, one store. Uh, that's what it looks like. This is the decomposition. Okay, nothing special. Start end for of training and validation. Look at autocorrelation. Uh, those are bits you guys have already seen, but this is just a reminder to get you into the routine. Look at those things anytime you start before you actually pretty much before you before you start applying any sort of time series method, whether it's a rema or something more fancy. Have a look first. What does correlation auto -corre auto correlation? What does partial autocorrelation look like? What does the seasonal decompose look like? Uh, Autoarima, we want to find out the uh, optimal order of the model. We allow up to seven lags in uh, our AR and MA parts. Test, we use uh, Dickie Fuller to see if a given order of differentiation makes sense or not. Uh, sorry, that's max. That we start with the max values. Uh, we have weekly seasonality. We, I mean, those were guesstimate compromises, really, the value here, so that an exhaustive range of values is checked, but it doesn't take forever. Voila, we found the best model. Six, six, autoregression of order six, so the last six days are relevant. Differenced ones, I think, and this combination of parameters in the seasonal component. As you, uh, our seasonal model looks uh, exactly as before, we get a proper detailed diagnostics. So yeah, printed in a fantastically fa fa uh, fantastically friendly manner. This three actually belongs together with this one. So this should be here. But because of Kaggle formatting, it just wraps it up like this. I'm sorry, that was not an awful lot I can do about that one. Uh, the same diagnostics as before. Uh, the visual summary of the diagnostics person, I'm especially a fan of the QQ plot because it that gives you a quick overview of where are you doing fine and where are you doing horrible. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, sample quant uh, theoretical quantiles what what should be the distribution of our values uh, based on the target? And this is what our prediction is. And ideally, you want those things aligned uh, uh, along the same line. Since they are not here, you can see that in the high quantiles, we are overshooting a little bit the, the high quantiles and undershooting the low ones. So, but in the body of the distribution, by and large, we are fine. And this is what the forecast looks like. Uh, da, 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 da. And, uh, okay, I hope you can bear with me for this part, at least before questions. Last week we talked about profit. So let's see what happens when we pit profit against uh, Arma. I mean, profit, new, modern, and stuff. Arma, um, vintage. 
like been around next to forever, at least as far as time series are concerned. Um, we're we'll using uh, data from uh, Nifty 50, uh, specifically for Tata Steel. Uh, actually, I was wondering a moment, and, uh, and then I realized, you know what? What do I have close by? I have Tata Steel. Like, literally, Tata Steel Mill is, I think, 11 kilometers from where I live. Uh, luckily, by the water, so the wind blows away. Uh, let's use the data set for this one. It's an abundance of information. So we will use a, we will use one characteristic to make it slightly smoother, VWAP. For those of you not familiar with uh, financial parlance, VWAP is volume weighted average price, which is effectively <coughs> smoothing the values of the price depending on the of how much was traded in the stock exchange. Uh, so we're gonna focus on VWAP only. This is what it looks like in this in this case. Uh, we can have, and that's a useful trick to remember. Even if you don't have explanatory variables to use with your forecast going forward, like reliable weather forecast for traffic intensity or something, you can always say, and that's frequently doable in practice. Well, I know my historical values. Like today, I know what happened a week ago. So at every point in my sample, I can perfectly legally use shifted values by one week or whatever, you know, uh, the whatever the lag is at which you can justify it. So let's see if we can use the lag values of uh, the daily high and low prices and volume standard panda stuff unfortunately we have to kill missing values uh, because what i praised as an advantage of profit last time is not an advantage that arma uh, that arima shares uh, training test split ta -da -da -da. fit arima in the same manner as we did before that's the beauty of auto arima you just feed the data well, the ex argument we didn't use before, exogenous, pretty much self-explanatory. The, expl the uh, ex extra variables. Fit the model and then call predict. I mean, it feels so nice to move from the stats models universe to scikit-learn style syntax. I mean, you don't realize how abundant this has become until you, until you, until you are in an environment where you can't just call fit and predict. Uh, stepwise search as before, slightly longer. Fit the profit for comparison with with different with the default parameters. Generate the forecast from profit uh, for a refresher of why it works this way in profit. Uh, check it from last week. Voila. Original data. Uh, profit forecast. Arima forecast. Not super visible. Okay, let's actually look at a ridiculous thing is you can't find, at least I didn't manage, a root mean squared error as a single function where you can specify that I only want a number of digits. So I had to write one. As, as you can see, Arimax is do auto Arima is doing minimally, and I mean minimally. Like what is it, 0 0.09, something to the tune, worse than profit on the same data, vintage model versus something that's built well ages ago, which I would argue is a solid argument in, the, in favor of keeping Arima in your toolbox because it can achieve comparative performance. Uh, you get out-of-the-box confidence intervals so you can find out what's actually going on and assess your uncertainty without going for, you know, MCMC sampling from a non-parametric model. So let's be honest, much as I remember, much as I respect uh, the creators of Hamilton Monte Carlo, it is a bit of cheating if you're just sampling from a curve. That's not, that's not proper probability. Uh, so, yeah. That pretty much concludes the Arima part of our series. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I do have time to answer questions. 
So if you are interested uh, in participating in that part, uh, stay tuned. Okay, so yeah, we are already out of time. Do we take questions or do like we take I said, questions? Like I said, I am I am fine with taking questions. Okay, so when when you started this last part, there there was a, not a question but a comment that I suspect Arma will win. I never got good enough predictions from Profit. So what's your experience around it? Do you want to say something? Uh... I'm actually rather surprised by this comment. I'm rather surprised by this comment. I, uh, I mean, I can understand it emotionally. Like one thing that a lot of people are promoting in the context of classification models is smoke, like oversampling, undersampling. I never got it to work. Never ever have I managed to improve a model by smoke. I don't know why. Weighing observations is what gets the job done for me. Uh, maybe in your case, uh, profit is cursed in a similar manner. But uh, Marco, if you could elaborate on the types of data you were dealing with, because yeah, without it, what can I say? I have no reference point in my own context <laughs> to, to 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 share on this one. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's take this one. So uh, he's thanking us. Uh, for the series, I don't mm -hmm. know why people thank me. It's all Conrad, by the way. <laughs> so what? Abhishek what is, 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 ladies and gentlemen, Abhishek is overdoing the modesty bit, but uh, as you not... follow the channel, you're probably used to that by now. So I am learning good. from the series. It's a little <laughs> bit difficult for me, but yeah, I'm trying. So what approaches can we take? I think we had we had similar questions like this, like two or three times uh, today. Mm -hmm. Uh, what approaches can we take when the time series is irregular and when we have discrete values instead of continuous? With, Ar with Arima, okay. Uh, there's two aspects from each other, uh, to each, to both to one and to two. Uh, if the time series is irregular, with Arima, not an awful lot. Aggregated to a frequency where it's regular. Uh, with Profit, you don't care. Uh, when we have discrete values instead of continuous, I'll... Uh, Kinda depends on the range of values. Uh, and a really non-elegant, but brutally efficient approach sometimes is if you is that you ignore the fact, excuse me, that they are continuous, sorry, that they are discrete. You treat them as continuous, you run predictions as continuous, and then you post-process. Like around them to the nearest integer for all I care. Uh, this works. It's not, of course, it's not the only way to go about it because uh, you can also, um, well, model explicitly the fact that this is, that those are, that this is an integer valued series. Uh, let me look it up. Integer arima. Yeah, Einar process something like this. Yeah, yeah, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, Poisson. Poisson in our one regression model. Poisson in our one regression model. Uh, essentially, just type integer valued arima. And go on a go on a go on a wiki crawl. That would be my uh, that's if you want to be elegant. If you don't care. Treat it as continuous and then post-process the values. The only thing you need to be careful about is if, uh, because it's discrete, it's not supposed to go below zero. So you might have to take care of this one a little bit. Uh, alternative trick, a slap a logarithm on it. If something is supposed to be positive only, slap a logarithm on it, model the logarithm values, and then f uh, apply exponent on exit. I see Abhishek smiling. Yeah. It's not like I invented that trick for time series. <laughs> Let, let's take the next one. How do you handle missing values in target? Skip those rows. Skip those rows or, uh, uh, well, depending on where they happen. If they <laughs> yeah. are, like, if they are, like, say I have a period from 2015 to 2021 for data, 
and then uh, I'm supposed to predict 2022. Well, you could make a case that 2022 is missing values in the target, uh, which is kind of what profit is doing. It, in profit, there's no real difference. If you have something missing during your original observation period, I mean, your training data or outside, it's all the same. It's all the same kind of extrapolation. Uh, in Arima, uh, get rid of it. There's nothing you can. There's nothing you can do with those observations. I mean, they are useless anyway. So I think this question was answered in the previous session. Yes, uh, but no was problem. it right? Uh, MCMC param MCMC. Uh, I, I don't think there is an MCMC uh, parameter itself. It's called MCMC samples or or whatever. Uh, how many? How many MCMC samples are you generating based on which your um, your confidence interval will be calculated? Uh, up to a point, the more the merrier. It's it, it's like with calculating an, um, a sample average. That's a good intuition to think about it. If I want to calculate an average of, of a certain parameter like uh, height in a group of people, the bigger my sample, the more reliable my estimate. Obviously, the error of my estimate of average height of people in this country based on five people will be horrible compared to if I take 5,000 people. Uh, 10,000 people will be better. Probably before above 10,000, there will be increment, but it will be uh, very small. It's kind of similar with this. There will be a huge difference if you go from like uh, free MCMC samples to 20 or 50. But going through 50 to 100, probably not that much anymore. Interval width, uh, what's the coverage you want? Uh, my God, I hope the Bayesians don't kill me. What is that? What? How big do you want the chance to be? What's the chance? What's your intended probability that your that the parameter actually sits in the interval that you uh, estimated? It's like uh, what I shown er what I shown earlier the mean plus minus free standard deviation. This is uh, ninety five percent standard ninety five percent confidence interval for uh, for the mean, uh, which means we have ninety five percent chance that yeah this indeed covers the true value of the mean. So the more confident you want to be, the higher you set this value. But that obviously means also the interval will be broader. Um, the question is, how do you deal with low signal to noise ratio in financial data with this matter? Actually, this question was in the like the middle of your presentation. Uh, but I think, uh, can you give some insights around it? Aggregate, start by aggregating to some reasonable frequency. I mean, okay, I know financial markets have changed in the last 10 years and 10 years roughly is when, well, when I was last working with high frequency data, uh, as in on a professional basis. But even then, I think we reached a conclusion that meaningful model prediction at frequency higher than five, every five minutes, there's just too much noise. There's just too much noise. So you need to aggregate the data to like five minute intervals. And that's when you actually start seeing something. Because about that, it, I agree. Six, the noise, the noise dominates. You go to deep, the, the noise, the noise just dominates. Uh, so aggregate to a lower frequency. Uh, what else? Well, regularize the daylight out of your models. Because that stuff is unstable, like seriously unstable. Uh, so, yeah. By the way, comment, sideline note, guys, leave it in comments or something or, or mention in Discord. Is there a broader interest in things that are specifically linked, uh, related to financial models? Because if there is, I can, uh, well, well, we can introduce an episode around this one as well, because models specifically built for finance for stochastic volatility garch etc well they come with their own set of fun uh, i wasn't planning for now because 
I thought Garch kind of lost, well, start, started, the, you know, it's March towards the mausoleum, but I've been wrong before. So if there is interest in financial applications, specifically financial and, you know, volatility clustering, whatnot in, in finance, uh, let us know. Either, either, either in the comments or better still in Discord. And then we'll most certainly take that into account in the in the planning. I mean, if, if you're <laughs> if you're asking people that they want if they want to learn about something more, obviously they are going to say yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can prove you wrong <laughs> by coming up with examples. We already we already have like three comments in in the live chat. Four now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So obviously people will be interested. Let's sure. take a few more questions. So is it conventional? Is it a conventional approach to take multiple time series related features in a data set and use generative models to generate like a vector representing the multiple feature set? What? Uh, multiple time series related features. In I mean, I don't see the forest through the trees. I understand parts of the question, but I don't think I understand the joint message. Jo I, I think I don't, I even I don't understand the last part of the question. So if, if the person can elaborate or if you do you understand? I'll hazard, I'll hazard a guess, but if someone, if uh, Pranav, if you can elaborate when I, or comment where I'm moving in the right direction, I would very much appreciate that. Uh, if I understand you correctly, if you have a ton of time series features, is this normal to use some sort of model to compress this uh, to, a, to a better representation of the features? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't exactly see why would you use a generative model for that, a generative model for creating synthetic time series data, yes, Yes, that's that's done occasionally, or at least I well, sorry, I know one guy who does it, uh, who gets paid to do it in a large company, which I am not allowed to name because she's classified and whatnot. Uh, but uh, yeah, things like I have five hundred features, I'm gonna pass them through an autoencoder to get a more coherent representation, which I then use as my external covariates, because that's gonna be a bit cleaner. Uh, well, meaner, leaner, cleaner, and uh, less noise. Yeah, sure. Sure. Mm. I mean, crude example of this one, you take a bunch of external features, you pass them through PCA, and you use the PCA as explanatory variables. I mean, at least you know what the hell is logging on to what. So, yeah. Yeah. Do ARMA models provide accurate long-term forecasts because they quickly converge to the mean? And there, there is a, like a follow-up question from the same guy. What are your go-to models for forecasting long-term and short-term forecasts for univariate and multivariate time series? Uh, long-term, I like ARIMA indeed. Uh, and the fact that, yes, yes, they do converge to the mean, which is a, which is, which is a good thing. In a, <coughs> Which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Good thing is more or less along the same line as your intuition guides you. Yes, they do quickly converge, which means they capture long-term trend. And if things remain more or less stationary, nothing, uh, uh, there's no like a seismic change happening. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Arima will Arima will get you through go, going forward. Uh, Arima is not very good in, in uh, dealing with. Uh, rapid changes. Like everything you would have predicted with Arima uh, in terms of whatever, business objectives, you name it, uh, would have gone out the window the moment COVID happened. I mean, in all fairness, all the sophisticated people had their stuff go, go, gone out the window when COVID happened as well. So it's not exactly a problem purely with Arima models, but yes. Uh, when I go to most forecasting long-term and short-term forecast for univariate and multivariate. For multivariate, actually for, for uh, long-term multivariate and univariate, uh, ARMA or vector version of ARMA, namely vector of regression. 
that would be the first thing I would go for. Short-term univariate, probably whatever I can get to work fastest, uh, like um, LSTM or something. I, pr I probably start with LSTM. I I haven't I haven't gotten the temporal. I, I'm not I'm not feeling that comfortable with temporal fusion tra transformers yet which people are claiming are going to do to LSTM what LSTM did to uh, to RNNs in terms of uh, pure predictive performance. And there is some indication it might be true, but I'm not there yet. So right now I'd say, yeah, to summarize, uh, long-term for both variations around the linear model, because there's just so much going on, you need something robust. And linear is a, I would linear model like this is a decent compromise between robustness and uh, uh, expressive power. Short term for multivariate probably something like LSTM. Uh, for uh, for univariate, oh, LSTM like GBM whatever whatever I don't know. Flight of fancy takes me. Probably probably like GBM wouldn't be bad. Especially if I can play around with generating different features. Let's see how transformers work at some point. Oh, it, it is on my. I'll show you my to do list. It looks like a okay. European Commission pedal. Um, so the next question is what is the specific reason to choose Arima as unobserved component? Uh, as an observed component can also include autocorrelation variables. To choose Arima as an observed component? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, I, I literally don't understand was it, what does it mean to choose Arima as an unobserved component. Sorry. Uh, if I could ask you, uh, Ali, to, to, to like uh, make the question a bit more elaborate. So, so the context is a little clearer. Yeah, but you you guessed the previous question right. So the the person <laughs> wrote in comments <laughs> that yeah, that's what I asked. Uh, yeah, yeah, the interpretation was correct. Can you so, use autocorrelation variables? Uh, okay, hazarding a guess, assuming you're right and my intuition works. Uh, yes, you can absolutely use uh, autocorrelation over time as uh, as an explanatory variable. Yes. Yes, I mean, why not? It is one of the, uh, I mentioned earlier, the TS Fresh package uh, for, I stand by that opinion, that this generates more time series type features than you will know what to do with. Uh, and one of them is, is autocorrelation as well as, I think partial autocorrelation as well, at, at different lags. So yeah, try it. Listen. If you generated some weird feature or some one that seemed weird where you are not leaking information and it works, that's all the proof you need. That means that was a good idea. It worked. <laughs> so is there a specific reason? Well, you probably tried a few other things that suggest that trying this one might be good. I mean, what, what more reason do you need? So this question is multivariate time series collected as raster data with spatial information. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about modeling something like this as we have autocorrelation within space too? Uh, go for spatial time series or more specifically, uh, what's the phrase? Spa yeah, that's probably a good start. Yeah, Yon Park. Yeah. This is a bit more old school because that's like from 03. Uh, but essentially, spatial time series. Oh, voila. Spatial time series. Spa oh, exploratory spatial and temporal data. Spatial temporal analysis with Python. Start looking into those kinds of things. Uh, this is me mostly providing general purpose advice because, as I indicated earlier, I do not have enough lot of experience with this one. 
there's there's a huge amount of interesting stuff, including time series and only 24 hours in a day. So sacrifices have to be made and this chopping this one was the one for me. One of one of the ones for me. Yeah. We are out of time. Um, let's take one last question. This is more. I, I can do like another 10, 15 if you can. So no biggie. Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, okay. The questions will keep coming. Um, and uh, it's one and a half hours. Listen, uh, it's better than the other way around. The biggest nightmare of every presenter is so you ask us there any questions and you're met with silence and you know, <laughs> I was just saying, I want to be out. So this is this is more more generic. So like, let's end with this question. Can you tell us about an interesting problem you solve at work? Oh, I think it relates to time series. Oh, one that relates to time series. Ah, huh. it's a good one because funnily enough, I haven't done an awful lot of time series in the professional context. Uh, we were modeling, well, I, I've ran a, in a, a few times into, uh, what would you call it, failure models or survival models. And it's a, it's a class of problems that you can, you can, a um, bunch of different, kind of like in computer science, a bunch of different things, seemingly unrelated, can be reformulated and reduced to solving the traveling salesman problem which is why TSP is so important. Uh, in business, a bunch of problems can be reduced to a survival problem. Like you are observing something at regular uh, checkpoints. Mm -hmm. And then, well, originally in medicine, it was like some patients are alive, some are dead. But it can mean a machine failed or it didn't. And the thing is, at each point, you only know it failed. You don't know when between the previous, say, let's say I'm checking up on the customers in my client base every week. Uh, okay, this guy is still with us because he's active. This guy is with us because with us he's still active. This one is a goner because he signed off, canceled, whatever. But I don't, or disappeared. Did it exist? I don't know when did he decide to do it. Maybe we lost him right after my previous checkup when everything went fine. Or maybe it was a moment before I checked right now. That's what's called the problem of sensor data. I only observed once it happened. Uh, it can apply, like I said, machine failure, uh, patients dying in a hospital, uh, churn of customers. Those are all variations around the same thing that can be reformulated in, the, in this direction. Initial thing I did was uh, I tried to solve it as a, a survival analysis problem, which is cool, which is cool. Sp speaking with my nerd hat on, uh, survival analysis is interesting. Trouble is, it's a bit of a horror story to get to work properly in practice from a bunch of, for a bunch of reasons. Too long to get into, especially in time frame. Uh, and that wasn't that fantastic. So, so, so I started thinking, okay, do you know what? Yes, business says what they care about is uh, how long until this, how, I mean, like, what's the expected time until this customer drops off? What if we simplify this problem and we say, okay, what is the probability this customer is going to drop in the next week and in the next two weeks or something? And this way, you kind of transform problem from a time series prediction and a pretty heavily multivariate one to classification. Because you don't care whether it's going to happen eight days, 12 days, or 17 days from now. Just wanna, what's the probability, probability it's gonna happen in the next seven days, in the next 14 days? The problem of varying time horizon per user goes away. Uh, and you convert, in the, and that's a perfectly legit answer. Business was like super happy. They actually understood. They were like, actually, we understand that. We understand much better. Uh, converted, I reduced the time series prediction problem and a survival analysis one at that to multivariate classification. Well, to classification problem. Uh, 
I was rather proud of that simplification, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so that would be that would be a reasonably cool idea uh, that's, that that you can describe. Okay, I think I think uh, yeah, that, that that was very interesting. I think you're probably working on more interesting stuff these days. We are we are moving in that direction. We are moving in that direction. Uh, I mean, all across the general e-commerce space, people are starting to notice that, oh, yeah, we've been talking about AI for this. But how about we actually start doing something with reinforcement learning? Uh, that's that's a nice change. And then, I mean, it's still a horror show sometimes because getting enough decent, like, reinforcement learning can move mountains almost. It can do so much, but there's there's problems that are that have algos that have minimal requirements on the amount of data. Like Arba will work on fifty observations. There are problems that need a bit to converge, or reasonably like I don't know computer vision problems. There's problems that are data intensive, and then there's reinforcement learning. <laughs> so that's 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 a challenge. That's a challenge in practice a lot. Because if you want to look at signal that's actually meaningful, despite the fact that you have millions of people coming through your platforms back and forth, you want actual meaningful signal from which something can be inferred, it, it turns out you throw away the useless stuff. You don't have as much left as you would expect to. So that's, that, that, was, that was a bit of a discovery, to be perfectly honest. Thank you, Conrad, once again. Uh, thank you. Now I think we should end. So once okay. again, thanks, thanks a lot, Conrad, for joining us today. And it was really interesting. And uh, I learned a lot. And uh, people did too. I can see from the comments and the questions. And uh, Conrad is also available on uh, the ML space Discord from time to time. So if you have any questions, you can also ask him there. If your question was not answered today, you can ask in the Discord or as a comment on this YouTube video later. The notebook has been shared. I will also share it as a pinned comment to the video. So take a look at the notebook and uh, uh, do share the video with your friends and your colleagues. Do let them know about the series and see you in the next episode. That would be good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Abhishek. Well, thanks for being here, guys. Hopefully see you in the next one. Uh, in two weeks, which I better, which means I better start writing the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. See you guys. Bye. Bye.